trails and ghost towns. Share the adventures of our early pioneers as we explore the development of the Pacific Northwest and beyond with your host, Mike Roberts, and historian, Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. I'm Mike Roberts, and with me, uh, my storytelling friend, Bill Barley. And today, we're going to uh, a part of the country which I just love driving through, and I one day dream yeah. that I'm going to be able to ride a horse through this country. Well, lots of people do, Mike. That's the Nicola Plateau, and you're talking about that high plateau country south of Kamloops, east, uh, west of Kelowna, and uh, steeped in history. We're talking about 175 years of history, and this country, that peculiar part of British Columbia, really quite different than any other area, with exceptions of some parts of the Caribou, has gone through about five phases. And we're talking specifically about a little town called Nicola Town, which was supposed to be the metropolis of the Nicola Valley. Never made it, Mike. And then we talk about a town that was, uh, that was not supposed to even come into being, and that's, of course, Old Merritt, which is still alive and well. All right, we'll do that. We'll head to the Nicola country right after this break as gold trails and ghost towns continue. the Nicola country, and every time I go through that country, I haven't ridden it on horseback yet, yeah. but I think to myself, this grassland has been here forever, really. Yeah. Well, essentially it has, Mike. It was bunch grass at that, you know, in the, in, the, in the Indian era. It was bunch grass as high as your shoulders, actually. But the Indians did control. That was their domain, under Chief Nikwala, or Nicola, as that has been corrupted now. And he was probably the most famous Indian chief in the entire province of British Columbia. There may be some debate on that. I'm inclined to think he is. Very wise individual indeed. And uh, they controlled that country, and they lived in kind of a nomadic existence, traveling from camp to camp. And sometimes they would have underground or semi-subterranean dwellings called kikalis. Again, we call them sometimes kikwillies. That's yeah. incorrect, of course. Now, this photograph is, uh, shows one of them. They sure. must have been... Uh, I always think this is such a benign climate, you yeah. know, wonderful. And for this one, it must have been about the coziest residence you could possibly have. Warm, yeah, sure. and uh, you're all tucked up around the inside, and sure. there's the dog out front. Sure, covered, covered with dirt, and uh, so it was, it was pretty good. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't bad at all. But this, this tranquility was interrupted, you know, because first the Hudson's Bay Company came in into Fort Camus, and then on uh, up through the New Caledonia into Fort St. James. And so they had the brigade trails, Mike. And those brigade trails cut through that traditional Indian territory and went up to Kamloops. And there were, and there were trade items used uh, all over that area, of course. Now, th these are some Indian artifacts. This is a, what, a stone axe? Stone axe, yeah. Yeah. And th this would be obtained from, from that area, from sure. that region? But which is superior? <laughs> well, which did, the, uh, which did the native people think was superior after they got a taste of Hudson's Bay Axe? Well, this is an eye dag. You can tell by the shape of it here, you see. That's what that meant, eye that's, dag? Yeah, it's an eye dag. And that's an original one. You have to be careful of spurious specimens. But that, that would be one of the trading items they would, uh, they would trade to the, to the Nicola Indians. Now, this, this is one of those tools that a, a person would see and not recognize what mm -hmm. they had in their hands. Yeah. What is this? this thing for it looks like a well, poker i don't know that's a, a digging stick it's a digging stick actually for for digging uh, various types of uh, of roots rose uh, rock rose and so on which the indians ate for medicinal purposes and that came out of the nickel country as well in fact uh, bud gone uh, traded for that many many years ago and bud turned it over to me so uh, originally they might have used a stick but as soon as the hudson's bay company oh, sure. came in with iron they said sure. you know that would work a lot better digging those right. uh, root uh, root stocks out than the other no but no uh, doubt that about would it, go right. right past you you know you'd see uh, that and you'd think it was just yeah. a poker for a fireplace no, but it's really quite a rare item right a rare item okay so they the indian people are there yeah. and uh, hudson's bay company and the hudson's bay company comes in so the hudson's bay company thinks they control this territory they don't gold is discovered on the on the fraser river or one of the branches perhaps at Nokomen, perhaps at Tronquillo, we're not sure, probably Nokomen. And then the miners flood in in the late 1850s. And they flood in, most of them come in the easy route. And the easy route is, uh, is they thought, through the Fraser, but it wasn't. And here's what they saw when they came through this route. They saw the Indians had been there before them. This is a, a grave site with the effigies, really quite remarkable. This picture was probably taken around 1863 or 1864. Now, these are interesting <coughs> carved characters that yeah. the native people would 
Have, would those be their relatives or gods, or what would be those? Mm, probably relatives, almost certainly. One of them has a top hat on, and yeah. they like top hats. The Indians took very quickly to white clothing in that era, and they chosen what they wanted. They had a natural eye for, for artistry. And uh, so, the, so the miners came through, and, they, and they, uh, they went through this country, and they found the Fraser River was too tough going. So a lot of them came through from the Similkameen and came up through the old brigade trails, Mike. So they went right up onto the, eventually onto the caribou. But they were followed, they were followed in turn by, by the ranchers. The ranchers realized that these, these mining camps spread up all up along the, the Fraser River. They had to have meat. And so they, they began to drive in uh, the Longhorn cattle, actually. Um, General Palmer from, from, uh, from Oregon. There's drove a in. Palmer's Pond, I think, up in the, uh, in the highlands there, uh, just uh, above the Similkameen. That would be the same Palmer? That's right, the same Palmer. There's just a Palmer Lake just down over the line down there in that Okanagan County probably named after the same Palmer. So they so, were just chasing a market sure. by bringing the, the, the cattle in. And this was thousands of miles driving these cattle up there and then selling them and coming back with the gold. So kind of a dangerous enterprise. Well, some very intelligent human beings said, hey, why do we have to do that? Why can't we raise our cattle here? We've got the grass. We've got the ty right type of climate. We've got the terrain. And so some of your great, great cattle companies came into being in, in that part of British Columbia. And the Douglas Lake Cattle Company is probably the best. I mean, it's, uh, it controls hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres. Yeah, uh, Quilchena, is in there, Quilchena, yeah. uh, Nickel Lake Cattle Company, uh, all sorts of them. And some fascinating characters. William C. Ward, who was the guy who really put the Douglas Lake Cattle Company on a paying basis. And other individuals with nicknames like, well, Kootley was one of the famous, uh, famous Indian uh, uh, riders, uh, actually a boss on, on the trail, and uh, guys like Old Danger. So, so that Old is, Danger? Yeah. Well, that's a name that has a yeah, well, reputation attached to it. Well, actually, Mike, you found that in, in most of those, most of those cattle, cattle camps, just about everybody had a nickname. And most of them weren't uh, weren't uh, beneficial to the to the bearer of that nickname. Okay, Shorty might have been tall. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Lofty might around. have been a dwarf. Sure. Yeah, okay. Sure. So they came up there, and this is what the 1850s, small 1860s, 1860s, 1860s most of the time. They're right up to the 1880s, and that that area around Nicola Lake became quite well known. In fact, the Quilchena Hotel, which was established what about 1907, if I remember correctly, and it's still there. This is essentially a was it was designed for the for the ranchers in the area. So they have a general store there. This is an example from there. Now, Mike. you brought in this. Now, this is, must be one of the toughest things. Everybody's got, you know, an old tin. Yeah. But this, and this is so seductive, isn't it? Because yeah. it's a coffee tin with still filled with coffee. Yeah. And after half a century, Mike, I don't think the coffee's very good. This is Fort Gary Coffee, yeah. and you can see the Hudson's Bay Company sign on the, on the side, the of course. The flag is going to yeah. fly in here. And, there's, there's there's here. and they were given special permission to have that. And... Uh, so this is this was found in a, in an old cabin and uh, traded probably from I, somewhere uh, some sure. store like the trading post at the Nicola Hotel and but why didn't the owner open it? Well, he was storing it for a, for a, that big winter that <laughs> a, he didn't come back for, for a better day. Isn't for a that better great? Day. Yeah, well, that true. makes you ask that, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Why didn't he open it? And so and then we have after the cattlemen and about the same time, actually 1880s, 1890s, some of those prospectors looking for you know their elusive rainbow came through that high country, and they be began to discover magnificent deposits, usually very, very rich on surface and declining at depth. What, gold? Uh, gold, silver, and especially copper, Mike. Now, especially this is something, copper. You, something you brought in. I just couldn't believe this. This is actually a copper nugget. Yeah. And this looks like it would be virtually pure. Is that the, how good the copper was there? Well, the copper there was, was not as good as this, although it was 5%. A lot of the ore in that country ran 5% on the, on the upper levels. That's extremely rich. That's five, ten times as much as you have to have if there's any deposit of ore at all. Gee, and if you've got copper, which is, and, and good grades of copper, plus sure. a little bit of gold thrown in, you've got yourself a pretty good little mining operation. Oh, sure you yeah. have. Now, this mine here, this sort of hangs out right on the bald prairie, doesn't yeah. it, out in the open? Typical. Here's your grassland around it. This is the Iron Mask, and the Iron Mask is, uh, actually was burned some years ago to that, Mike. It would still be there, probably. In that country, those mine buildings last for a long time. Nice and dry. Oh, That's sure. Right. And not a big snow load, so yeah. you get ancient stuff hanging around the lawn. Why would they call a copper, a copper operation the Iron Mask? Was it just sort of 
sort of mysterious, well, the sort iron of mask. There was an iron mask in Rossland. There was an iron mask in other parts of the Kootenays. There was an iron mask, I believe, in the Smilkameen. There's an iron mask in the Nectola district. Mm -hmm. I imagine there are 15 or 20 iron masks in British Columbia. There are sort of mining names you sure use. Like this, this one is the Comstock. Well, yeah. I thought that was a silver name out of... Out of Denver, out of the Colorado. Comstock load? Yeah. No, the Comstock load was in Nevada. Nevada, okay? right. Named after... But this wasn't even silver. Comstock. This was... No, this is probably, probably copper. And I haven't done all the, all the, uh, the reference material on that, Mike, yeah. but this is the beginning of this particular mine. And it shows kind of the rough construction. Now, the name Highland Valley comes up already at this time. Sure it does. Highland Valley, of course. The old prospectors are the best in the world. They didn't miss much unless it was hidden from view. So all the obvious outcrops they got... Here's the glossy shaft, and this, is, this shows one of the original mines in the Highland Valley in 1915, Mike. Now, that's about half a century before the Highland Valley really gets underway with the open pit mines. Okay, so that, I mean, it was there all the time, but I guess oh, sure. technology sure. just allowed them to go for what they found, and there sure. was a lot more ore left in the sure. ground. And because of this, because of that, that discovery of those, of those magnitude of mines all through this valley, and here's a map that shows you some of the mines in this valley, Mike, and it's really astonishing. Some of these are showings. Some of these are bona fide mines on both sides of the lake. And they're copper and they're gold and they're silver and, and so on. So, so this attracts the interest of the Cattle Valley Railway, which is now making its way towards the coast. They decide to branch off. They're going to put in a branch line and they're going to go up. The government is quite convinced they're going to go to the southern part of Nicola Lake. So they establish a town site there, complete with a huge government building, Here's the government building as it sits today. It is not a government building because they made a mistake. They had a hotel. They had a whole bunch of houses. They had a whole bunch of stores in there. The government building, they're all ready to catch the rush when it came to Nicola Lake. And this was, was what, the Nicola Town Site? This is the Nicola the Town Site. Something intervenes. And what happens? There's a little place down the valley between Nicola Town Site and the Kettle Valley Railway called Forksdale. And there's a guy called uh, William Merritt comes in there, and he's a, he's a promoter. He's going to promote a line between Kamloops and Nicola and the Samilkameen, and that's all he is. He decides to change the name of Forksdale to Merritt after himself, and he does that. And then they discover a magnificent deposit of coal in the area. This is Coal Gully. Coal Gully. Yeah, and here's a shot of Coal Gully as it looks some years later. That's a really a big operation. Oh, sure it is. That's the Middlesbrough Colliery in Coal Gully. And that's the that's the actually the area of the Nicola Valley Coal and Coke Company. And that's yeah. one of there's Diamond Vale, there's Nicola Valley Coal and Coke, and there are half a dozen other companies in there in about the 1906 yeah. era. What's the attraction of coal? Just to fire the KVR, or does it have uh, bigger implications? Partly to fire the KVR, and partly because that boundary country is booming. There are three smelters in the boundary country. There's a smelter in Grand Forks. And the KVR Forks. goes right past those? Sure, so. and they go right past them, Columbia and Western, KVR goes right by them. So you have the, the smelter in Grand Forks, and you have this smelter, which is the Dominion Copper Company smelter, and that's just outside of Greenwood. And then right at Greenwood is the BC Copper Company smelter, and here's another photo of the BC Copper Company smelter. So all the coal that they're going to be mining out of the uh, Nicola country sure. is all going to head right down the line back to the copper can fire the smelters there. Precisely. And why run your rail... Why run your rail to Nicola when you don't have to run it? All you have to run it to is the coal fields. And so Forksdale becomes Merritt, and Merritt starts to boom. By 1912, 1913, 1914, mm -hmm. Merritt has come from nothing, from a couple of log cabins, into a resplendent avenue such as Quilchena Avenue. Yeah. And, and here's, here's everything a, you need there. There are sure. the hotels. There's the... And then some interesting architecture. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Well, that, one of those hotels is still standing. And this is, a, you go down Quilchena Avenue today and you'll see that this, this original hotel with a turret on the, on the right-hand side of the photograph is still standing. And you had a hospital there, which was mostly to serve the miners. And that's, mm -hmm. that's very important, because remember, this is, this is coal mining. Lots of accidents in the coal fields, Mike. And you had uh, a number of uh, uh, government buildings in there. You had the government offices. You had the, there's the first hotel called the Merritt Hotel. It's there. So you had, but you have inevitably in the coal fields, whether it's the Crow's Nest Pass or whether it's Vancouver Island or whether it's that Nicola country, you had accidents. And here's, a, here's an accident that came out of the Diamond Vale about 1913. It looks like a big fan. Is that, that's one of the yeah. ventilation fans? This was way, this was that, this is the ventilation fan to pump air into that mine. And there were only, uh, fortunately, when this, when, this, when this explosion took place, there were only seven miners in the mine. And they, of course, were, were killed immediately. 
burned beyond recognition. And that shows the power of the explosion because it tilt, tilted that fan right on its side, virtually destroyed the inside oh, of the no. mine. Well, this is where other artifacts come up. This Ministry of Mines, year ending December 1912. Yeah. These, these are wonderful things. Not only have great photographs sure. in them, but they also tell you the story of the time. And we've marked a page in here, and this has actually got the plan sure. of the Diamond Veil Collieries, yeah. number one. So, so here's where the, the fan would be on this, the end of this tunnel here. Yeah. And you can see how long and how extensive all of these tunnels are and it marks the location of each one of the fatalities. And it names Kelly, each one. Paddy, Templeman, Fireboss H. Grimes, Baxter. It tells, and here's Hogg, tells where the locations of yeah. each of the bodies were found. Yeah, it names each of the seven miners that were, that were killed in that particular explosion. Coal is a, a kind of a dangerous thing to mine, isn't it? It's well, there's no doubt about it. And, uh, but coal was, was, brought most of the money into that country. You know, the first, in 1910, 1911, 1912, about fifty thousand dollars a month and it built up from there and uh here's an example of the of, of the, uh, the middlesbrough colliery this is number one tipple and this shows how how massive this this uh this operation there's the has kvr become. locomotive coming up there sure. it's coming up to get the uh the ore at this yeah, stage coming up to get the coal the coal okay. at that stage and remember that the coal seams in that country this was the valley was 10 miles, about 10 miles wide, gold bearing, and three mi 10 miles long and 3 miles wide. Coal seams from about 5 feet to 12 feet thick. So definitely worth mining. So obviously a lot of coal taken out, but probably a yeah. lot left behind. How many companies did this attract in the uh, final analysis? Well, about six or seven major companies. And uh, the big Coke and Coal Company in Nicker Valley was the, was the biggest of all, Mike. And they had several hundred men working for them. But remember... This is an interesting town. You haven't just got coal miners here. You've got hard rock miners. You've got cowboys, and there are probably 150 cowboys to 200 cowboys in the 20s and 30s in Merritt. You've got a number of Indians down in that lower, lower Nicola country and all around there. So you've got, and you've got loggers also, and starting to come into its own there. So you've got four different factions. And generally, young men of that age don't like each other too much. <laughs> and, or they've got interesting and aggressive ideas of what makes for a, a fun Saturday night take a break and talk about the town itself and uh, the kind of a place it was right after this break. Those towns or tonight's show, I guess you can come back to cow towns, mining towns, uh, logging towns, okay. which Merritt was. And you're, you're really talking quite the modern age here, 1920 and up. Well, you're talking 1920s and 1930s. And when you look at Merritt in the 1920s and 1930s, look at part of Merritt. Look at Quilchena Avenue on Saturday night, Mike. Yeah. And I have an old, old friend of mine who was about 86, actually, 85 or 86. And he was a newspaper man in Merritt. He would not go out of his room on Saturday night. He watched the goings-on on Quilchena Avenue. He, he looked straight up, down. Sit up in his room and just watch the, the parade. And it wasn't a good idea to go out on Main Street in Merritt unless you were willing to, to back it up with some knuckles because they would come down the street and the miners would mix with the, with the loggers and the loggers would mix with the Indians and the Indians would, would fight with the cowboys. And it was really quite a sight. In fact, there was a tough little cop in there, a guy called Kerr, Constable Kerr, BC Provincial Police. And he used to have a, a regular battle with one huge, huge a adversary on that main street virtually every, every night of the, uh, at least every Saturday night of the, of the summer months. Was this a kind of a betting thing? Well, I mean... <laughs> the guy would use his boots and Kerr would use his, his, his blackjack or billy, billy club actually he had. And Kerr was a very, very tough operator. In fact, he was pretty hard on the Indians and rather a sad, uh, sad um, death of Kerr because uh, there was some Indian trouble. I guess it was in Lower Nicola. In, in the 1930s, and he went out there with a friend of his, and he started to wade into the Indians, and uh, they got carried away too. And they killed uh, both of them. They killed Kerr and his, and his friend. And they took his car and pushed it over the, over the edge of the canyon, and it was supposed to go down into the river. Then it would have looked like it was accidental. They'd run off the road. Yeah. It actually hung in a tree. The car was found the next day, and the Indians were arraigned for murder, and, and they were hanged for that. And, uh, but he was a very, very tough cop, and... Uh, and uh, he came to a very sad end. So it, it, was a, it was a very, very tough town indeed. No, I mean, how would you be a, a police officer in a town like that where the normal course of events on a Saturday night is assault and mayhem? I mean, is that just... Oh, yeah. that's, I mean, 
We're, yeah, we're a bit sissified, are we yeah, now? Well, typical, really, of anything that has to do with mining, whether it's coal mining or whether it's load mining or whether it's plaster mining, not unusual You really at all. couldn't have a good time until there was some yeah. blood on the, on the ground. That's right. It attracts a strange, strange bunch of individuals. So Merritt has, has done very well and exists as the, as the major town of the, of the Nicola country. And, but you look at the other town that was supposed to be the, the up-and-coming town. This is uh, Nicola town itself. And it's really funny. It sits out there on the road just to the east, sure. of, and suddenly you find what looks like a, what would be the reason for this uh, official-looking settlement area? Just yeah. a piece of bad planning. That's right. You have to know the history of the whole area. And it's rather a, a town with an interesting mood, kind of an interesting ambience, Mike, because if you look in that little cemetery in the Marie Church there, you will find that the, that the, the, the gravestones there and then the statues there are equivalent to anywhere in British Columbia. Don't know why exactly. Some very, very um, moving, moving statues in that. And this, this photograph here shows one of a number of the statues in that little church which is fairly close to the government building, actually. And the government building now is inhabited by, by a family, ranching family. And uh, the old hotel has gone. Some, still some magnificent structures in the immediate area, including a couple of uh, marvelous ranch houses. But Nickel itself has passed on. Uh, opportunity knocked once and didn't quite make the door. So what do you figure the chances are for uh, rejuvenation in this area? Is there any, uh, any wealth left in the country? Well, there, you know, there's all that cattle country, which continually yields wealth and, and, and uh, so that all those ranches essentially are still alive and doing extremely well. Uh, the coal is virtually gone. I don't think there's much chance for coal, Mike, but I do think that there's some opportunity for, for a good load prospector. And if you, look at, if you look at the old mining maps of the area, and I've, I've examined them fairly closely, and I'm not into prospecting anymore, but if, if I were, I would concentrate on those areas that yielded a lot of either showings or mines. And they tend to bunch together because of the, because of the, uh, the formation of, of the rock in that particular area. I think I would probably concentrate on either side of Nicola Lake. Perhaps the west side, I looked through that very, very closely. There's an old saying, you know, if you go grizzly bear hunting, hunt in grizzly bear country. And uh, that's true. You don't wander out beyond that. The same applies to prospecting. So I, I would look, and you might come across some magnificent... Uh, deposits of copper, and the co price of copper is not great, but remember there are gold and silver showings in that country as well, Mike, and that go right back from Dawson's map of um, about 1898, which is interesting, and shows some of the original occurrences there, and a lot of those miners used that to discover, discover mines and properties later on. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I would be concentrating on, on either side of Nicola Lake and, uh, and taking my chances there. And as you say, all of the other showings, uh, all the mines came from surface showing, so sure. if you've got the ability to go a little deeper, you may get into some, some wealth. Oh, but sure. you, the Cochino Hotel is still there, though. I mean, the grassland is still there, the lake, great fishing. I mean, what a great place to go and uh, absorb some of that history. Oh, yeah, it's a marvelous area. First rate. It's the uh, Nicola Valley, the city, the town in the Nicola Valley that's still in existence is Merritt, and it is a great place to go and put some of what we've been talking about together with what you see. See you next time on Gold Trails.